Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for your, for your kind words of, of introduction. Uh, the, the field of innovation, in particular social innovation, is a, is a very, very broad field. Uh, it can be too broad, and um, it also is a field that brings different disciplines together. It applies to different sectors of society, not only the non-profit sector, but certainly the business sector and then also the public sector. Right? And it has to deal with a quite significant interest on behalf of national and international governments, all eager to learn about how social innovations or the capacity to innovate can help solve their problems. So it's a field that has to deal with a diversity, but also with uh, pressures, with expectations. And that's a bit of the background uh, to my talk. I'd also like to say, before I go into the presentation, that uh, you can interrupt me uh, any time. Uh, I have about 30, 40 minutes of uh, slides prepared, but uh, we, um, uh, we don't, you don't have to wait till the end for me, uh, uh, to, for me to finish to ask questions. So feel feel free to do that. We can turn it into a conversation. Uh, as the presentation is much less of a conventional uh, summary of a particular research project I've done, it's more like talking about the field of social innovation and to some extent also my involvement uh, in it. Uh, I started first uh, looking at the, the issue of innovation in a setting that is very, very different from the one where, our, where we are today. Uh, I looked at, uh, in the late 80s, when I was finishing my dissertation, uh, and I had to do, uh, I had to keep up, um, I had to make a living, uh, I, I did some contract research uh, for a, uh, a foundation, and uh, they were very interested in uh, innovation in, in Africa, in particular in the informal sector of African cities. And, uh, and I had worked on in, in and on Africa for quite a, a number of years, and the, the project was about innovation, innovative business strategies in informal sector economies. It sounds quite a, a mouthful, but what's behind it is that if you are a small-scale entrepreneur in Lagos or Kumasi or Accra, and uh, you w are either a metal processing, uh, you run a metal processing firm or a wood processing firm, either furniture or some metal furniture, or you produce simple engines, uh, how do you deal with the fact that you uh, don't have finance or that you uh, don't get a particular spare part or that you are suddenly uh, barred from a particular market? Right? So what are these survival strategies of small-scale entrepreneurs in very, very fragile urban economies? And, uh, and that's, that was my introduction to the, to the world of, of innovation. And then fast forward. Uh, when I worked on the nonprofit sector, um, and uh, uh, Jim, you, you probably uh, recall uh, that we looked at some point at the behavior of nonprofits, and people were arguing that nonprofits are especially innovative. Right? And you can take that as a proposition innovative relative to, to what? Right? To what government does, what business does, but don't they do different things? Can you compare them? So, uh, as part of a large-scale project uh, at Johns Hopkins, we then uh, looked at what is the behavior of nonprofits when it comes to being innovative. And uh, as you probably know, uh, if you read the papers that came out of that research, we didn't really find the answer because we said it's too complicated. There are too many other factors, compounding factors, that let us pinpoint that a particular innovation or innovative capacity can be attributed uh, to nonprofits qua organizational form. Then uh, I worked on nonprofits uh, on innovation in the field of philanthropy, foundations, very often claim that they're innovative. Well, are they? Uh, right. And then when I moved to Heidelberg uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I founded a center for social investment and innovation. Right. And the idea behind that was a very simple one. How do societies invest in their own future uh, knowing that they need to do things in a different way. It's kind of a very abstract question, but that was the motivating factor, was the thrust behind that uh, center that we founded. And in the last five years, we have carried out quite a number of projects 
looking at innovation in, di in different fields, be it arts and culture, be it social service delivery, be it uh, education, uh, very much funded by European Union grants. Now, that's important. Uh, uh, the European Union decided a couple of years ago in the Lisbon Agenda to have an innovation policy so that the European Union countries should become much more innovative. And of course, you, what do you want to innovate for? You want to compete with the United States and China. So there is a major policy push to support anything that has to do with innovation. And we were the benefactors of it in a way because we could now look at social innovation. So what you, what you hear me talk about now is a kind of a summary, is an overview uh, of what you might call uh, Helmut Anhai's view of, on, on innovation. Right? But it's, uh, it's very much uh, colored by my own experience of research in the field. Now it says, what are the issues for policy and what are the issues for research? Let me start with policy. And uh, the talk will then be an elaboration of these issues that I think we as researchers have to deal with. Uh, innovation is one of the most complex and complicated words that we have in the social sciences. And it has so many different uses. You can travel the, the long and cumbersome journey from one definition to another, and you're really not the wiser. But it's a field that is characterized by a certain conceptual tangle. And I think with that come sometimes rather diffuse research agenda, we need to clean those up. I think we should probably focus on a select set of core research questions, and I'll tell you what these might be, that allow for interdisciplinarity. Right? And I think we should open up to new and emerging knowledge fields. In other words, where are innovations taking place now for fields where we will have a need for innovations in the future. It's, kind of, uh, it's difficult to think about, but um, uh, an example would be all the developments, the fascinating uh, developments going on in cyberspace at the moment. What would be the social innovations that we could possibly associate with that in future? And, and for that, I think we need to be careful in handling the expectations that come from the policy side to that. In the concluding section of my talk, I will particularly focus on what the policy expectations are vis-a-vis -vis nonprofit organizations. Right? But you could do the same for other sectors of society as well. And there are the parallel issues that I think the policy community might well address when it comes to, to innovation. Right? Um, if these uh, look to you very um, generic, just give you one example that are not at all generic. If uh, the Obama administration, and I think we should all be grateful for the Obama administration to having picked up the idea of, this, of social innovation, if they set up the social innovation fund, but do not re are not really serious about putting serious money behind it, that's a good example of what could become political window dressing. So if you want to have social innovation help define the future of a community, of a, a state, of a country, you better put some resources behind it. But don't arouse all the expectations of people in the field and including the research community. So let's be realistic. That's what I end up with. Uh, these are the tasks ahead of us. So we need to do a bit of clearing up of the research agenda. We need to focus. We open up uh, to new fields that might emerge, right? And let's uh, keep our feet on the ground when it comes to social innovation. Let me spend a few moments on conceptual matters. Uh, I don't want to bore you with it, but as you know, concepts are very, very important because they help us define and see reality. And this, the field of social innovation uh, has a built intention uh, when it comes to the what we actually mean by, by innovation. There is this long tradition of Schumpeterian innovation, uh, definitions. Right? Uh, I used Rose Cantor. Uh, she, used, uh, uh, she wrote a very important book about the change makers in the business community. And her 
uh, definition. You see, there's nothing really wrong with that definition. Uh, it, is, it is quite useful. It is used a lot, but there are many, many variations of it. The point is that this, you might say, somewhat neutral definition of what an innovation is meets a normative definition. And that normative definition does, in fact, uh, inform quite a lot of the research that, for example, the European Union supports. Because the European Union is interested in research, as you can see here, that is the best of all world, that takes up something about need, and it takes up opportunities and creates a better outcome for everybody. But is that necessarily the case? Right? In a Schumpeterian vision, there are winners and losers. Is it actually possible that we can have innovations, social innovations, where everybody wins? So we have a win-win outcome. Uh, but how do, we, how do we get it? Can there be bad social innovation? According to this, a bad social innovation would not really uh, qualify. But who are we uh, to judge? So there is this quasi-neutral Schumpeterian view of social innovation and this rather normative, right, with a good feel attached to it, view of social innovation. And I think the, the feel has not really come uh, to terms with that. You could continue looking at uh, complications. Right? Is, can you really have a purely technological innovation? Or are all innovations somehow social because they take place in a social setting? See, where does the social end and where does it begin? You can talk about this endlessly. The point for a social innovation is that it is different from a pure product innovation or service innovation. It implicates others, it, implic it implicates communities, it has what economists, economists would call a positive uh, or negative uh, externality attached to it. It's sometimes only possible as a joint production, as a co-production. Right? And it has spill in and spill over effects. So if um, we uh, come up with a, a policy innovation, with a new uh, governance innovation, that uh, in countries that depend a lot on each other without coordinating with the other country, you would have a negative spill over uh, uh, as well. Uh, currency uh, contagion effects are a very good uh, example here. So is it really need-driven? So do, you, do, do we start innovating when there's something wrong? Or do we also start innovating when we don't even know that something is wrong or that there might be opportunity costs involved, but we anticipate something better? So what is the role of the entrepreneur here, the social entrepreneur? Do they do both, or are they better at one or, or the other? The creative destruction potential is one of those thorny issues. You know, we have no problem talking about the creative destruction potential of market innovations. Right? That drives out established businesses. It then gives, uh, creates winners. Others are better off, and uh, perhaps even society is better off in the end. Yeah? But what about social innovations? Can they also be destructive? And uh, f for whom? A long, long debate, in particular when it comes to innovations in governance, governance innovations, I'll say more about that in a moment, whether what are the conditions under which we can create governance innovations where everybody is better off? Right? So is, can we also think about innovations that, that take away some benefits Let's say uh, we, a new way of taxation right, will probably make some people worse off than, than others. But in the end, is society better off as a whole? So who benefits is one of those critical questions behind uh, innovation research. And I think that innovation research has probably paid not enough attention to the distributive effect of social innovations in particular. One of the uh, neglected topics, because we take it so much for granted, is that of innovation as a purposeful, rational pursuit versus serendipity or happenstance. Right? Uh, 
So I'm the social entrepreneur. I see, oh, there is a big problem in that community. I, I know how to do it, right? And I go about it in, in this way. I conduct a stakeholder mapping and focus groups, and then we find a common solution that we then implement. Very rational way, right? That's the way planners think, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm, I continue to struggle with what um, Hirschman called the hiding hand. It's a, it's a very beautiful uh, principle, and once you start thinking about it, it makes you reflect not only about our role as people in the public policy school, but also our role in society generally when it comes to innovation. Now, uh, you know, Hirschman argues that there are so many instances in the life of policymakers, planners, where we kind of trick ourselves into being more confident than we actually should be. Right? So uh, there's a very famous example that he uses in his book. It's actually an essay called The Hiding Hand, um, taken from 19th century infrastructure <coughs> projects in, in the US. So you had a, an industry, an industrial area in western Massachusetts, and they, uh, of course, noticed that uh, the population is moving out out west, and they wanted to be part of the, uh, they wanted to have access to the markets in the Midwest and then out west. And what stood in the way was a, a mountain range in western Massachusetts that, uh, so they had to ship their goods first down to New York, then up to Hudson, and then, um, I, I don't know exactly the geography there, but uh, they, they thought if we go through that mountain, we're going to cut off New York, and we're much faster than the New York businesses to get the goods out uh, to, uh, to the Midwest. And the engineers and planners said, oh, it's no problem. No, we, we've done tunnels before, and we, we just do another one, even if it's five miles long. And it turned out to be a total disaster. They ran over budget. Uh, but, you know, Hirschman then asked, would they have done it? Would they have done it had they known of the true implications of, of what they were planning to do? And he argues, no. And then he turns it into a general principle, which I think is, is really a beautiful one. Because if innovation right, involves some act of creativity, right, so an invention of something new uh, that is then developed and becomes the innovation. But if you have to have a kernel of creativity, the problem is that you cannot really plan for it. Right? You can create conditions that make creativity more likely, right? but you cannot really plan for it in the sense of a project where you have to count on delivery. Right? So he, uh, I let you read this without uh, uh, me reading it to you because you're much quicker at reading than I'm at uh, reading it aloud. Uh, we trick ourselves into that confidence trap, and that's very, very often behind the f uh, innovations. That somebody takes on a task that is much too big for him or herself, but she is or he is under the illusion that it can be done. And then once you're halfway there, you see, oh my, my goodness, you know, it's kind of used and we have a problem phenomenon. What do we do now? And that's where creativity comes in. But you, uh, it sounds very nice, but you can turn it around and say, uh, could it not be that some of those things that we're most proud of were the, <laughs> the product of happenstance that we just stumble upon rather than planning? See, that's the essence of what he says here. We, uh, we say, oh, we sleeped, walked, into World War I. Right? There was absolutely no necessity for World War I. But we just had bad politicians who didn't really know what they were doing. But can we apply the same the other way around? And, and Hirschman says, yeah, we should start speaking about falling into truth, but that somehow success can happen without us really knowing that we're about to create it. And you need to keep this in mind uh, because when you talk about innovations, the last thing you want to do is think about innovation as an outcome of something that can necessarily be planned for. Right? Innovations happen without a plan, they happen with the plan, but they, they may not happen according to plan. 
because creativity is difficult to predict. So, so these are some of the complex, uh, complicating aspects of the definition of social uh, innovation. Now, and then, who are those people who innovate? Right? We, we talk about organizational, in, the creative organizations, but the innovative organizations. Now, organizations don't innovate, it's people who do it. Right? And entrepreneurs may find themselves inside and outside organizations. I think uh, countries differ quite a bit. Uh, uh, some European countries have a lot of intra-organizational innovations happening, and they make it more difficult for entrepreneurs to be outside a particular system. Social service delivery is a good example. You see the Swedish welfare state, the Dutch or the German welfare states are actually quite innovative, <coughs> but they, they do that in a modular way internally, whereas the way the UK operates right, is very often that the challenge comes from outside. Right? So what I'm trying to, uh, to say here is that innovation ultimately is about people, right? people do the acting, but where they are located and how they then go about acting can be quite, quite different. Right? So it's about who, but then we also have the sector. Is it a market sector? Is it a public sector? Is it a non-profit sector? If you look at innovation research, right, the, the, there, is talk, there is talk about innovation in the public sector but it's usually seen as a problem. We somehow seem to have lost confidence in the public sector being the key innovator. I'll say more about that in a moment. Right? Most innovations, of course, happens in markets, happen in, happen in business settings, technological innovations, of course, but uh, the nonprofit sector, including uh, civil society more generally, has become a focus of social innovations in particular. Now, to some extent, that's a displacement of an emphasis on government as the main engine behind social innovations. Right? That's the um, kind of the political development of the last three, four, four decades. Can we, in fact, expect nonprofits to be such great social innovators? Let, I'm coming back to that theme of nonprofits as innovators in a moment, but I want you to keep in mind here that we, uh, we tend to think about social innovations as being primarily located here, when we might as well think about, as I do, as social innovations that, that goes across all, and government has a particular role in making sure that it can harvest the social innovations that take place here and in in the business world, right? The social, uh, the social media at the moment, right? They didn't come out of the nonprofit sector; they came out of the business. But they, are, they are very, very social in their implications. They are, I would say they're really social implications, uh, innovations, as such. And then, at what level? Right? They can be at levels that we're used to, but they can also be uh, in non-contiguous units. Uh, they can also be an, uh, in cyberspace. What do I mean by non-contiguous? These are the innovations that are taking place at the moment. They are characteristics of large urban areas. Right? And so that the social innovations happening in a place like London are very similar to what you might see in New York or, or LA. Right? But they wouldn't happen 50 miles outside London in Oxfordshire. Right? So that the innovative patterns um, that, are, that, that jump uh, geographies. So, and then what kind? What kind of innovations? There is a very rich literature here that I'm sure you are familiar with, that, and they try to uh, categorize <coughs> innovations uh, as they do here. Uh, that's, I think it's a very useful one, because what they're arguing is that innovations can either question the entire system or they can take a particular aspect of it, right? So either you change the entire architecture or you change only a room of the house, so, so to speak. And you get incremental, radical, architectural, and modular <laughs> innovations. 
very, very useful ways of uh, classifying. And what I want to stress now is the why. So why do people, or why do we find social innovations in, in the first place? There is a, a literature in economics that uh, plays largely on incentives, right? That emphasizes the incentives people have to innovate or not. Now, in the market situation, clearly, right? Uh, there are very strong signals for you to innovate, and there are rewards attached to you being the innovator. But what happens if uh, you cannot attribute the rewards of an innovation to the creator or the <coughs> inventor. Right? Does it necessarily mean that you have less of an incentive to innovate? Right? Does it mean that you have to deal with three riding issues, that you have to deal with other <coughs> uh, market uh, imperfections? Right? But in, in the market situation, now, keep in mind, innovation always has this destructive potential. Uh, we have a, a situation where those who are uh, not keeping up will lose, and others gain. <coughs> and in the end, so the argument goes, we're, we're all bet better off. Right? That's what capitalism is all about. So that's what uh, Schumpeter wrote about, that you know, if we let that system of creative destruction churn and churn and churn. In the end, the great majority of consumers will be better off. So we're better off today because we have smartphones and we don't have to deal with uh, old-fashioned uh, telephony anymore. Now, go on to public sector. There we don't have to create a competitive element. And in the public sector, we talk about weak incentives and weak signaling. Uh, that's more, it's not so much government in the terms of elected government and uh, no, the, the, it's, uh, the legislature is more the public administration that I'm, I'm talking about here, where we easily emphasize a certain inertia that you stay with your set ways. And there's, there are good reasons why public administration should be inert, but that does not make them the most innovative. Uh, when does the, when does, uh, the public sector, head of public administration, innovate. That's what studies tell us. This is a good paper by Warrens. Uh, strong demands by, by the political level. That is almost self-obvious. But the demands have to come with leadership. So these two have to coincide. Right? So that the legislature said, hey, we want you to do this, and we're going to see it through. And you are going to do it. Right? No questions. Asked. You can usually do that only at the beginning of a term. Once you're about a year or two into a term, it becomes more difficult. So this kind of innovation in the public sector is a bit of a, uh, it's like a stepwise function, right? So something happens, and then nothing happens for a while, and then if you get a change in government, it's going to happen again. Yeah. Um, how would you differentiate that from just having a normal policy change? Like when you believe in the equilibrium theory, then that's just how politics changes in the public sector. Yeah, now I'm just uh, listing the, the uh, when when do you get innovative capacities um, released in 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 the public administration? It tends to be associated. It tends to happen at a time where there's a very strong signal sent from from the policy level, and and then when you have crises, that's uh, a crisis and also a signal. Think about the um, the, in, the many, many innovations that happened in the financial world after the 2008 crisis, and when we get uh, new opportunities. Right? But what the literature tells you generally is that of the three sectors, right, the for-profit, the non-profit, and the public sector, the public sector is the least likely to be, uh, to be innovative. But I would argue that it's also the one that carries quite a significant potential to uh, in, the, in the field of social innovation, yes. You may be talking about social impact bonds a little bit yep. later, but you know, getting back to your argument about connecting those innovators to the rewards of that innovation, do you think that rather than simply 
the rewards being society at large, and therefore one could imagine a municipal bond is, is covering that for a locality, that somehow a social impact <coughs> bond would somehow tie better the rewards to the innovation, or, or is it just a different package? The, uh, the, the social impact bonds, are, are you familiar with these, right? And they, um, uh, they are, the first of all, they're an innovation in and of themselves. And uh, if you could tie the fact of a reward scheme of in, uh, of that is, is organized like a social impact bond to, innovative, um, to in incentives to innovate, um, I, I haven't come across that, but it seems like a, an idea to explore. Yeah. But let me um, come to some of those um, innovations that involve um, a government in, in a moment, or governments, governance rather. And this is civil society. So the, uh, this is what the literature tells us. And uh, you know, Jim, you're probably as familiar with it than, uh, than I am. Uh, the lower transaction costs, that's the old Lester Salomon argument, right? Because nonprofits uh, are, are local, they're close to the ground. They can involve many non-costed items, like, uh, like volunteers and so on, right? They have a lower transaction costs uh, in bringing about solutions to new problems, right? So, uh, and what helps them is a certain value base, so people are committed to finding solutions. They uh, act out of a community spirit. They only don't want to maximize their own utility. And because you have multiple revenue sources, you have a diversity of connections and views. Right? People say civil society has all these different voices. That means you, you also connect to many, many different parts of society. And the more connections you have, the more likely you come across a new idea, or you stumble <coughs> across it, as Hirschman uh, would say. So the connectivity that comes uh, with civil society is one of the main assets that makes it uh, prone to innovate in a, in a social way. Right? And you, you can turn the, the argument around is that sometimes the, uh, the relative isolation of, the public, of public administration from mainstream society makes them less likely to innovate because they're not exposed to uh, a range of information that civil society can benefit from. So let me, um, I'm now proposing a, a, a research agenda, but I want to uh, skip that and focus on uh, uh, what do we actually know about innovation, social innovation uh, in particular, and I'm going to wrap in uh, governance innovation as well. By, by governance innovation, I mean uh, how do we find new ways, novel ideas of solving public problems. Right? And this is a review of the literature. It goes over three, four slides, so don't think this is the, the end of it. But if you, uh, if you were to have a summary of what does the innovation literature really tell us as far as, as, far as social innovation is concerned, right? but we look at also innovation in other fields, uh, this is what comes up. So there's typically some uncertainty. right? Of course, you know, if you innovate, you don't really know what, uh, what the end of it is. And you have to be able to absorb the risk of that uncertainty. Then knowledge intensity. They, uh, very few innovations, in particular in today's world, happen without people having a good understanding of the system. Right? So what Hirschman talks about, the happenstance or serendipity leading to innovation is more likely to happen in knowledge-drenched knowledge, knowledge -drenched systems. Right? So if you have knowledgeable people attacking a new problem of which they know a bit about and can have analogy uh, established, that's much better. Uh, controversy, right? Um, which I like a lot because, not controversy, I like that finding because we have to move away from this implicit understanding that all social innovations are nice, right? That everybody's going to like them. No, because they, they're very often uh, taking place in highly politicized environments. So uh, people may not like what is being proposed as a new idea, so you've got to, got to fight for it. Reaching across established boundaries, that's a deep insight from organizational uh, sociology in particular, right? 
that innovations are more likely to happen at, at cross-section of things, where things overlap. Right? So uh, social sci uh, scientists have pointed out too that people get good ideas if they cross from one field into another. Right? Or that's why I, I'm just at the end of my sabbatical here, and which I enjoyed because I, I was exposed to new you know, conversations, to new impressions. And I even had a new idea. So, but, but I wouldn't have had that idea you know, had I remained in my normal job. So that's reaching across established boundaries and exposing yourself or being exposed to different views. And reaching across boundaries, is, that's what civil society does, right? So if you have people in civil society and they represent different walks of life and different interests and different values, that's what's meant here. Right? Long-term commitment. So a few innovations just happen, and then you walk on to some, something else, so you have to stay with it. And innovations need ambassadors, so they need champions. And the, the, lo the social entrepreneur, as much as we like him or her, is very often not the best ambassador for what they come up with. So you need to think about social innovations being networked to others who would then carry it forward. Right? That's uh, what is meant here. And then uh, common themes in the social innovation literature. Uh, if you have a problem and uh, one solution is, oh, let's throw money at it. Doesn't, no, that's not it. Uh, you need some resources, but material resources are, are not it. I think the combination of knowledge and resources is what brings about innovation. That, that knowledge can be a social knowledge. It can be knowing the community very well, knowing whom to call and whom better not to call, but it can also be technological innovation. It can be economics. It can be uh, many, many things. And long-term systemic views involving partners, taking risks, finding leadership. Or that it, it reads a bit like a management cookbook, but uh, that's indeed what, what you find. Right? Uh, what makes for good social innovations has these characteristics. Um, then governance innovations um, are a bit different from regular social innovations because they typically uh, aim at a systemic improvement of things. Right? So you want to change a system. And you can change a system in, in different ways. Either you throw out a system altogether and you put in a new one, or you, you work with the existing system and have incremental modular innovations that improve the overall governance performance. Right? And, and that's what we uh, find at the moment. There are no fundamental reforms in governance underway in any of the major OECD countries. Right? So what would have been a reform like that? Uh, Think about the welfare state. The welfare state didn't come from nowhere, right? It was usually typically created uh, in a relatively short period of time. Uh, uh, the way we know it today, it was created between the, the, the 1950s and the 1960s, right? And there were different uh, blueprints of what a welfare state should look like, the Scandinavian version, the UK version, be the beverage report, right? Uh, or the continental version. We, we don't at the moment have anything that would say uh, we're putting in place a new X state. Right? There, there are different proposals that are being made, but uh, at, uh, we live in an era where there are thousands and thousands of smaller government governance improvements being proposed. Some are happening, but they do not come from government that much anymore. Right? Many of those governance innovations that we surveyed, uh, that was at a Hertie School, uh, involved civil society. If you, you know, new labor in the UK uh, um, didn't come from new labor. It didn't come from old labor. It actually came from outside. Right? It was proposed by a bunch of think tanks in London that there is a different way of being a social democratic party. Right? Or the, uh, the change in the Republican Party, to how much of that came, came actually from inside the Republican Party and how much was carried to it, suggested uh, to it by some uh, conservative foundations um, operating in this country. So you have many examples of where 
political parties and government is maybe less in the driving seat than it was in the past, and some of it happens through civil society as well. And the, um, l these are some of the governance innovations we, uh, we looked at. Um, I can't, I'm not going to go into any of these. Uh, they on our website, you can, you can look them up. I will say something about the social impact bonds. Um, the debt break is a, um, a very controversial uh, topic in Europe. I don't know if you know about it. Um, uh, it's, it's being discussed in the States as well. So that it prevents governments from going into debt. So you have a constitutional amendment is you can't do it. Right? And the Swiss did it. Um, and then the Germans picked it up. And now uh, Angela Merkel wants to have all others, in particular Greece, <laughs> have, a, have a debt break. Um, well, good luck. Good luck with that one. Um, at a Norwegian a pension fund, um, right here, um, it, you know, the Norwegian pension fund is so large, it's so big, that uh, it can actually influence, simply by investing and divesting, uh, it's it, it actually a policy instrument by now. So if you want, if you, let's say, you don't want any money to go into tobacco, right, and uh, the Norwegian pension fund can help you do that, right? Because they, they have quite a lot of influence on investment decisions that other corporations and other funds do. This is the largest, I think it is the largest fund that uh, exists in the world. That's all the money from the oil. They put it into uh, kind of a heritage fund that belongs to all uh, Norwegians. And um, the, the Chiang Mai initiative, multilateralization, that's more in, in the field of financial politics after the Asian crisis in, this, in the 90s. They put up this buffer, governments put up the buffer. Um, but these are the ones that involve civil society. And let me focus on, on, on these. Um, the social impact bonds. Um, let me just ask you, you, you are familiar with these, right? So I don't have to uh, t tell you about it. Uh, they just issued the latest report, uh, Social Finance. Social Finance is a, um, an NGO in London on how the bonds are doing, because they're now in year number four. Right? And they, the contract between the government, the, the service provider, the, the nonprofits having to look after the, uh, the prisoners. Do you, you know the case, right? I don't want to talk about the case. Uh, uh, in, in one or two sentences, um, prisons, prison systems all over the world, not only in the UK, have a problem with relatively high recidivism <coughs> rates. So that if uh, prisoners are released, the likelihood of them being back in prison are very, very high. And that is very costly to society. Right? So the idea was, how can we reduce recidivism rate? Right? And there was this um, NGO, a, a think tank in London, and they said, well, the problem is that the system that we have in place at the moment in, in England is broken. Right? So you have uh, prisons who are totally overwhelmed with the prison population they have, and they, they simply can't look after the, you know, usually men once they are released. And then you have the nonprofits, the social service agencies, uh, they, in a way, in an almost um, perverse way, benefit from the system because the more clients they have, right, the more they can turn around people, uh, the better off they are. But you know, think about it. Right? They're not being paid by their success. They're being paid by the number of people they serve. If it's the same guy 10 years in a row, that's good right, for them. It keeps them in business, and they get government money. And government is implicated because government had no idea what else to do. So they kept funding a system with relatively high recidivism rates, a failing system. So they had this idea that we have to reallocate risk. So they. They, they got a prison system, it's in Peterborough, in Cambridgeshire, uh, outside London. So uh, we are going to be your guinea pig in that. And we do the following. If you manage, you the social agencies, right, and the prison, if you manage to reduce the recidivism rate by 10%, 
after th four years or three years, right? We pay you that amount. If you manage to reduce it by 7.5% after four or five years, we pay you that amount. And if you don't manage it, we pay you nothing, says the government. Right? So now you need investors, you need social investors. Right? And the market didn't really come in, but well, foundations did. Right? Some of the larger UK foundations, like the Cadbury Fund and, and so on, they came in and the report was now released, and, and guess what? They didn't get a 10%, so the foundations weren't paid back anything. But they got 7.5%. But if they managed to keep the 7.5% reduction in recidivism rate, they get the money, right? So everybody's quite happy about this outcome. So we can solve, or ha at least have a dent in the social problem. Can we not? Right? And it, at the moment, it doesn't cost us, the taxpayer, any money. So everybody seems to be better off. So there's so much excitement about this idea that uh, it's traveling to other fields and to other countries. Right? So this is the one to watch, I think. Uh, there, you can also see two things. One, uh, it, it's very simple. It is strikingly simple. Right? That's the first thing. It's not very complicated. Number two, you can modify it. Right? You have a basic structure that you can finesse and adapt it to different circumstances. But it has one requirement that is very often rare in the social service field, and that requirement is that you, you have something that you can count, right? Like a return on, a social return on investment has to be established. And in this case, they, they asked an independent um, evaluator, it, uh, it was a university professor from, uh, from uh, the University of Leicester, to do the evaluation. And they all accepted it, right? That it's, it's true. So this is a very, very good uh, social innovation. Very, uh, oh, let me say, it has significant potential. Think about uh, schooling, right? If you, have a, if you have failing schools and you set targets and you ask, ask investors, are you willing to come in? In a way, are you willing to take a bet? But, but you know, why do we then have that confidence? It's not a Hirschman type hiding hand, but it means that we somehow put the social service agencies into the center of things. So there's going to be a lot of pressure on these agencies to deliver so they can no longer kind of hide behind some government contract. Right? So this is a social innovation with potential, but it will also mean that some of the professions involved will find a different environment be it social workers, be it educators. Now, these are some of the uh, examples about governance innovations in, in particular uh, that we, we see happening. So there is an involvement of civil society, but that involvement goes only so far. At an early stage in a, social innova in a governance innovation, you need the buy-in of the public sector. If that doesn't happen, it tends to uh, evaporate, uh, if you wish. And then the, we observe there are two processes when it comes to innovation that um, are quite, that we observed a lot. You know, the historians say there's no, there's nothing new under the sun. But when we are innovative, innovation researchers, for, uh, for us everything is new, right? And, and the, the truth is somewhere in between. Because many innovations are not genuine new creations of something that never really existed before. There's usually some modification or there's something that you take from a particular context and put it into another. Right? And that is what uh, is meant by refunctionality and recombination. Uh, not very nice terms, but they, they are, are very deep. So by, by recombination, we mean that you take one element of what you already have in your organization or in the system you run, and you combine it with something new. Right? And the idea is that this gives you then a competitive advantage in, in addressing a particular uh, problem. So 
the recombination. For example, uh, corporations taking on social responsibility programs. Right? So the corporation has states in the business world that it says, oh, to improve our market positioning, our overall fitness as a corporation, we now have corporate social responsibility programs and we do community work of different kinds or do something for the environment. Right? So that would be a recombination or nonprofits taking on um, yield management that uh, the airlines have been using to allocate, to sell seats, right? You can uh, have many different ways of, um, uh, of revenue generating, generation in nonprofits without really thinking about making a lot of money, but you have a better resourcing altogether. So you have a nonprofit component coming together with a business element. Uh, refunctionality means that you basically take what you are, what you've always done, but you move to another field. Right? You apply what you have learned elsewhere into a new set of circumstances. So when for-profit corporations move into areas typically done, populated by nonprofits. Right? So when, uh, for example, Lockheed decided at some point we're going to bid for uh, a contract, a government contract to provide social services in the state of Texas. Right? They, they said, oh, we are very good at managing complicated systems, right? building aircraft and jet, fighter jets. Uh, the knowledge we have there, can it not be applied to something that is also very complicated, social services, right? So they migrated with that. And refunctionality and migration happens an awful lot if you look at social innovations as well. Right? So if you take the um, uh, a Grameen Bank, right? that um, is the one of the largest NGOs in, in the world. Now, the, the idea of the, of, of the Grameen Bank is is actually a very, very old idea. And you find aspects of the Grameen Bank in the United States in the 19th century as you find it in 18th or 17th century Europe. I'm sure you find it in China at some point, right? But a particular pooling of resources by populations excluded from more formal financial institutions. <coughs> but then th taking this idea and implanting it into a Bangladeshi context and then linking it to other activities, that was the innovation, right? So it was both a refunctionality and a recombination. So, and I find that a very, very useful way of um, looking at what is a social innovation. Keeping in mind, if you do that, you move away from the idea that all innovations are necessarily genuinely new. They don't have to be. They're just new in their combination and they're new in the context in which you apply them. Right. Uh, this goes to uh, the, uh, the public system again and we looked at uh, how our ideas picked up in different countries and they do actually vary quite a bit in the way signals are being picked up by the public sector. Right. Now when we have a social innovation fund in Washington and we have different funds like that, under, you know, they don't have the same name in, in Europe or in Canada, uh, that is their primary task, if you ask me, is to pick up these uh, social innovation signals and ask yourself, uh, what can we do? Can they be, should we vet them? Should we give them a chance by themselves? Can they be scaled up? Can we roll them out? So if government is no longer the seat of innovation, the way it maybe was at some point, at least that is the role I think that government uh, ought to have, to be the arbiter of social innovation. It doesn't have to be the arbiter of, of business innovation, of course not. But social innovation, it can, be, uh, it can have a role. Let me um, uh, skip over that uh, and perhaps in conclusion, uh, come back to what I said at, at the beginning, that we have to be cautious, uh, both as researchers, but also as representatives 
of, of sectors, be it the nonprofit sector or the business community, when it comes to demands being made in terms of innovation. Right? And nonprofits have, over the last 40 years, been subject to wave after wave after wave of a different expectation brought to them, very often by government. And the latest one is that the nonprofit sector is the innovator. The whole innovation aspect is lodged with the nonprofit sector, civil society, disproportionately. And, and I just want to be want us to be aware that we may want to think about this because very likely nonprofits may have to disappoint. They do, of course, innovate, but are, are they up to the kind of expectations that are being, being lodged? And I want to, and, and, and I'm very glad to see Jocelyn in, in the room. Thanks, thanks for coming. Um, because Jocelyn um, knows that um, uh, nonprofits have been exposed to these, uh, you could almost say, ideological claims of which social innovation is, is the latest. <coughs> right? And the first one was the new public management part. It was a typically 1980s phenomenon when the argument was that nonprofits are actually better at providing many services than government. For, and economists made a good argument, you know, said it's true that and, and circum circumstances we can actually farm out a lot of government activities to, to nonprofits. Right? And this is what was, was being said. So we need to, uh, to modernize the, the, the welfare state, if you want to call it that. Right? Uh, we have to think about market making, establishing quasi-markets, and nonprofits are just very good partners uh, in, in doing that. Right? So, and so we have uh, the US welfare state reformed in, in the 90s. We, subsidiarity was talked about endlessly. In Germany, the NHS was reformed in the UK, and, and so on. So many, many examples were pushing new public management. You see, that in itself was an innovation. Right? Even if new public management has many critics now, few of us want to live under the system it was 20 years ago, or 30 years ago. Right? It was not the most, uh, uh, it was not a, the system we, uh, we, we know now. But there was a very simple equation here. Right? We simply have to do that, and in, in the end, we, we get a more effective way of service delivery. So that's why nonprofits were fully implicated. That you might always think of that as the, the Reagan agenda of the 1980s. And then uh, we came to discover civil society, and, and now we're saying, well, nonprofits, act, uh, nonprofits are not only good at providing services under certain conditions more effective and efficient in government, they, they're very also very good in keeping society together. Right? So the, the kind of the Putnam-esque argument, the Tocquevillian idea that uh, what makes a country like the United States function is you know, the, the, the thousands and thousands and thousands of small groups of, of citizens that, that they care, they engage. Uh, the, the social capital, the, the non-profit sector as a generator of social capital. Sounds familiar, right? But the idea was that, that the nonprofits can help rejuvenate society. And you know, we had a call for civic renewal and the like. So we need to engage and we need to learn how to trust. And nonprofits are the way of doing that. And then uh, came the idea of accountability. That we said, oh, we have all these accountability failures, right? Starting from Enron, but going on much, 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 much beyond that, right? Every country has its scandals. Uh, whether it's HIV uh, um, in, in France, whether it's huge embezzlement cases uh, in the public sector or here. And then we say that we need these nonprofits to look over the shoulders of, of government because the political party system is weakened. And the political party system is in cahoots with, with government, right? They're captured by professions, you know, the lawyers and, and so on. Hey, so they were then the watchdogs. So and the latest is that um, next to the accountability 
argument is the one on social innovation. So we now argue that nonprofits are better at social innovation than governments, and that what we need to do is to find some form of partnership between the innovative potential of nonprofits and then the capacity of governments of scaling up and rolling out. Right? So that's the promise that we, we bank on at the moment. And we see that in the social innovation funds. We see it in the impact bonds. And we see it in also what is called the Great Society uh, initiative in the UK. But that Great Society has been reduced a bit. It's not that great anymore. Um, <laughs> we, and, and we're going to have elections um, in the UK um, in about two months' time. And we'll see what happens to the Great Society then. But you see, the point is, we should be kinder to nonprofits or maybe a bit cautious, saying, you, you're doing great things, but will you be able to do be the best of all worlds? Right? Can you be a super service provider? Can you be a Tocquevillian tool to re-energize society? Can you help us with our accountability deficiencies? And can you be the social innovator? And I sometimes have my doubts, and I sometimes think that uh, we use the word the term civil society as a shorthand for society as such, right? Because when we, we increasingly see the nonprofit sector as a representation of, of, of society rather than of a particular set of organizations and interest communities. But um, I, I basically have come to, to the end, but uh, this is uh, the, the social investment component that lies behind the impact bonds, because we talked about them uh, before. It's a useful slide. Um, it was developed, uh, I didn't do this, it was developed by a uh, London-based think tank. And um, they, it, I, I, like it, you, I like it because it gives you the whole sense of uh, what the toolbox looks like for social investment, which I see very close to social innovation, right? Uh, here we have grants, so that's what a foundation would normally do, for example. And here we have mainstream investments, right? So that's what Lehman Brothers did in the past. And we, we have focused a lot on that, right? That's what business schools teach you. And this is what um, we in the world of philanthropy um, uh, did a lot, right? When, uh, no, Jim and you, when, when we teach about foundation management, that's what we tell our students about how to manage grants and grantees. Right? And but what we often do not spend much time on is the area in between. But that's where the music is going to play in future, more than at the fringes. Yeah. Oh, um, so you're in this great position to be in Europe and know the US. So how much of the social innovation is driven by government versus <coughs> The agenda at the moment is in Europe absolutely driven by government. The agenda. And the, uh, behind that is um, the e European Union and the implementation of what is called the Lisbon Treaty. Right? Um, it is triggering down to the national governments. At the forefront uh, is the UK. Right? Like in, uh, the UK is always an interesting country to watch when it comes to policy initiatives of, of a different kind, particularly from a US perspective, because it's halfway between Europe and, um, and the US in many things. Um, the German government is, is behind uh, in, in, in both senses of the word. Right? It's behind social investment, but it's behind in being serious about it. And um, we had a meeting at, um, at the chancellery, chancellery with Merkel um, about uh, two months ago. And that was the, uh, the second time that she convened a meeting on social investment. So you can say that uh, she does that in the first place is almost a victory, right? Because she has other things to worry about, I guess. And th but it, that it comes almost into, uh, now long, how long has she been in power, right? So late in her tenure that you, you may also think it's, it can't really be on top of her agenda. But, uh, the, I think the, the nonprofits themselves, they are, I don't, I don't see them being, I, I, I would modify that. The more I think about your question, I think 
certainly in the UK, nonprofits and the representative organizations of the nonprofit sector and the foundations make a big thing about the social innovation agenda now. Um, but that's probably the only country where I would say that's the case. But it's, 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 that's why I ended up on this cautious note about nonprofits, because I, I, don't, I, I see great potential in the nonprofit world for social innovation. They have done it in the past. They could even be, do more of it in the future. But let, not, let them not be hijacked by, by a government idea that will change in five years anyway. Right? So we had four of these. There's going to be another one, I'm sure. But if I, if I were to say what, is, um, what you could do at the moment from a research perspective, and, uh, uh, but then who am I to say that? But, you know, uh, how, do you, how do you link what goes on at, communi at the community level, not necessarily in the nonprofit sector alone, but at the community level to, a, to the next tier, uh, be it uh, the state or be it a national one, so that uh, it doesn't remain isolated and that we, have to, that we don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, too many times. That's the big challenge for social innovations, of capturing innovations, vetting them, nurturing them, scaling up, rolling out. That's where we're weak. This is very, very sad to wrap uh, the, the social impact bonds, I think they, that they would fit maybe in the, 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 the central circle, central step. Uh, I, ju I just wonder, as you research more about it, where does the returns for the investors come from in the social impact bond? In, in, that, um, in that particular trial run <coughs> it, with the prisons in Peterborough, right, they, they, didn't, they had a recoverable grant. Right? They just wanted to get their money back. They, um, but you can, you can think about a, oh no, let me put this, uh, it's not quite true, because they had a, you have a payment scheme that you attach to performance. So had they, had they succeeded in uh, reducing the recidivism rate 10% after three years, they would have gotten their money back plus a, the return on investment, so it's some profit margin. If they get it down to 7.5% by year five, but don't quote me on that, but it's, it's something like that, right? Then they get their investment back so they don't have a loss. But you, you, you can play with this. You could say some foundations might come in and say, oh, we, we really want to uh, have a recoverable grant. Or you can say that uh, you get a grant component of 80%, we give you that, and if you then, um, uh, uh, if you're really good, right, 20% we have something else. You, have a, uh, you, have con you can think of a concessional rates of some sort, and, and here investment plus, then you, you have a very, very different scenario already. You know, when you were I mean, some of your examples, like the recidivism, for example, um, seems that there's a certain class of, um, sort of social innovation uh, projects that wh where these kinds of uh, <coughs> innovation bonds right, would, would work in the sense that you, it's almost like a challenge grant, right? I mean, it's, um, so if I'm, if I'm the government, I can say, well, I want to achieve a certain objective in terms of school outcomes in terms of how, how well children perform on test scores or how well or how, how you know, any, any kind of measure. The key is you have to identify there's a certain, certain class of problems where there's a person who can be assigned that, I guess the term you used was accountability, but in a sense someone to whom it falls to uh, in some way, because, but to the extent that these are, you have another category of of social innovation, I think, uh, sort of context, or would be where the pro where the issue itself is sort of is so diffuse, right? Let's suppose uh, racism in society, right? We want to accomplish something, mm -hmm. but you can't put up a challenge grant because whom do you whom do you pay off, right? Because yeah. it's something that's there's no there's no sort of node 
that, uh, that anchor some accountability or responsibility mm -hmm. for achieving uh, exactly. yeah. the outcome yeah. that, that you want. I don't know if that's something that you've that's, looked at. That's, be that's being discussed a lot because uh, the, t the term is used to you need to anchor it, right? You need, you need an institution to, to judge because there is, no, there is no market as such. So not, somebody has to tell you, yes, you achieved it or you didn't achieve it. So you need an, an, a, a neutral referee even, right? And you need a, uh, in ec economics, you would say a numeraire, so something you, you can count and that everybody accepts. So it would be a uh, number of prisoners um, released from prison and uh, fully integrated. But it's not just did it happen, it's did you make it happen and therefore should oh, I pay you? That's what I mean, is anchoring it on you, right? I mean, I could go take credit for, oh, the kids did better in their test scores and there was less oh, recidivism yeah. or there was less this, please pay me, right? So, but, you know, so, so the question is not just that, it's that you brought it about through your actions and therefore we should pay mm -hmm. you for having achieved this wonderful result. I think in, in the terms, uh, in the case of the prison, uh, that that was not uh, was not seen as a controversial thing because it was the social workers looking yeah. after the prisoners. But it could have been that you know. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that there are some contexts in which that will work, and then so that's one category yeah. of, and then there's another category in which it doesn't work. Again, I say something like racism in society. Who they who would it pay off? They, they right. Even not. if even if you could measure it and yeah. say yes, it's yes, it's improved. Who would you? reward because no one can take credit for having achieved it. There is, um, you, uh, you, you're absolutely right, and, but le I would say let, let the proof be in the pudding because if now people being excited about social impact bonds start applying it to different fields, um, where does it work, where doesn't it work? And I think when you come to a sense where you, um, ah, there's a, there a term for that, where you cannot attribute uh, a causation to a particular group. Uh, yeah. I mean, one of the issues is, so how many places can social impact um, actually work? It's, you can't take over the all of public problems with social impact bonds. But the way social impact bonds are at the moment, you're right. I, I look at it as the beginning of a whole field, what you might call social finance or social investment markets. And then uh, many things will be possible. At the moment, the social impact bonds are in, in this kind of, uh, kind of you know, uh, criminal justice system, where it's easy to count people and the attribution problem is uh, manageable. Education um, and uh, human, uh, human services um, as, as well. Where, energy? Yeah, sure. Um, oh, the energy markets. Redoing um, housing to make it more energy efficient. Yeah. There's some deals yeah. on that. Mm. There's a study that came out, uh, Social Finance, uh, a few weeks ago. They, they looked at uh, in uh, to different countries that have social investment projects and the fields in which they happen. And um, uh, in, in a, most of the ones in Germany are almost exclusively in education. Right? And, but I don't know why, why, that's, why that's the case. Um, one could, one could imagine, I don't know if people have thought about it this way, on a continuum of uh, what makes a public good versus a private good. Mm -hmm. There are certainly those, and you can imagine social finance on one side mm -hmm. of the continuum, it becomes very dedicated to a program. On the other side, you're talking about municipal bonds or, or mm -hmm. you know, sure. you know sure. for these general mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. okay. That's right. And one, one, one question I had, and I also share a little bit of your caution about nonprofits being the social innovators. Um, and I think the way, one of the concerns I have is their ability to take risks because especially smaller nonprofits where any program they have, if they take a risk, if that particular program fails, the nonprofit actually will cease to exist. Whereas when you think about the private sector or a pharmaceutical firm or whatever taking these kinds of risks, they're taking it you know, in one piece of a portfolio of projects and so forth. And so you know, unless you somehow can Establish a stream of money so that a particular set of nonprofits can repeatedly take risks without the fear of failure. Then you're going to have some really big challenges. And I, I found this out when I studied 
microfinance institutions in the U.S. about 15 years ago is that the nonprofits that continued to to last actually were the ones that weren't loaning the money out because they were afraid to take the risk. So they, you know, so it was kind of like this kind of catch-22. Yeah. You survived by not loaning the money out, but you didn't actually do the work you were supposed to do. So I don't know if that's true in all of the groups, but that's the, one of the thoughts that I've had about risk-taking and nonprofits maybe not be the best suited to do that because they don't have a portfolio of projects from which they're receiving funds to take risks. Yeah. No. Um, I, and I agree about the risk one. It is, you know, if you take this and you, you could, that's from, you might say from the non-profit or from a philanthropic perspective, but you could have a government perspective. What are now the financial tools of government relating uh, to this? Um, and of course the financial service industry that opens up um, a whole new way of thinking about portfolios at, at a community level. It, um, uh, it puts these uh, funder collaboratives in a new, in a new light, right? Think about uh, what uh, LA funders in, in the 90s was a very conventional way of foundations pooling resources that nonprofits could apply for. But if you put it in context like that, much more is possible. Actually, the, in the social finance field here, they sort of have turned that up and they, call it, they talk about stack capital. So a foundation can come in with grants and then program related investments on top of that and they will absorb the risk and it'll bring in the mainstream investments. Oh, see, that's the portfolio that, that, that yeah, you're talking they, about. Yeah, they sort of stack it and they talk about stack capital. That comes from tranches and finance. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. 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 But, but they, that's, yeah. that's the language that you hear from these countries. You've been very patient back there. Uh, no, no problem. Uh, we don't have much experience, uh, at least in local governance, with the social innovation bonds, at least. But, isn't the question really how you measure success with respect to the either social or market bonds, or municipal bonds? In other words, what I'm trying to say is, my colleague is absolutely right as far as causation, but does it really matter? Because at the end of the day, for a government, the purpose is really the reduction of recidivism in this case down to 10%, because government knows very well that there is a cost attached to each person who goes back. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, if it's really a social innovation bond, it should really not matter whether who caused it at the end of the day, because the mm -hmm. measurement should be that we have achieved the reduction of 10%, hence the reduction to the cost to government. Yeah. So th it's really the measurement issue, uh, whether the private sector is measuring it, i.e. dollars and cents, or the government is then measuring it on the basis of quality of life and sa safety and security and reduction of cost to government. Is it not? Yeah, I, I don't think we have a disagreement, um, except that um, this is not a social impact bond, but this is the, the, the social impact bond is um, a, a, a way of social investment. Uh, but th that's the innovation. But it, they, the social impact bonds are not uh, social innovation bonds. They're social, right? Because they, they're about a particular problem that you, so the system is the innovation, not not what it does. Uh, my apologies, I, I mis misnamed it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I meant uh, yeah. but, uh, impact. The, the idea here is that uh, uh, there, are, there are there are many areas in in society where the ultimate success is very difficult uh, to measure, but you can uh, measure certain um, deliveries that you then associate with a successful outcome. So. So if you reduce the recidivism rate by 10%, and let's say, and you have, as a result of that, 800 people not in prison that normally would have been in prison, you, you, you then don't know what these 800 people are doing. They might, they might as well commit, continue to commit crimes, but you just don't catch them. Uh, or they could be doing many things, but you, we take simply that indicator as a measure of, uh, of success. Or if you manage to keep a child in school uh, that, would have m that would have dropped out. You don't know what, what that child is going to contribute in the end, but you, you think we, we solve that problem and we take that as an indication of an overall better performing system. I don't know if that uh, answers your, your question. Yeah. yeah. Um, my question is similar to Professor Zurians. Just looking at the design of many systems with high levels of 
combinatorial or dynamic complexity, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that there may be a risk for the right performance management or uh, evaluation methodology. I was hoping mm -hmm. you could share some insight on maybe some entities or efforts that have helped bridge that potential gap. Uh, yeah, but how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Good. That's. Um, <coughs> Uh, the whole um, uh, that you know performance evaluation uh, and when to do it, when not to do it, uh, that that would fill an entire t semester, <laughs> uh, almost to do it. I, I'm I can tell you what my uh, what my thinking is. Um, uh, this is where it comes in uh, when we we look at the organizational fields and and some are highly dynamic, some are less so, right, and some are complex, some are simple. You get different uh, expectations as to your innovation and adaptation capacity. And with that come also certain packages or toolboxes of evaluation. Right? They make more sense than in some instances than, than in, in other instances. Right? And my, my take is that um, these evaluations, uh, particularly in the nonprofit field, are here to stay. Right? Uh, we're going to evaluate ever more, uh, but we'll also increase our, I think, knowledge that they will have their limitations. And what we're interested in in innovation is typically an area, an area that uh, is, is right here. Right? Where what, what matters at the, at the beginning is not so much how, how well you do something or, or how good your innovation is. The innovation as such matters. And then once you start implementing it, once you start developing uh, more, more routines around what is implied by the innovation, then measures of performance come in. So there's a life cycle to when information, when these measures are useful and when not, in addition to where you are. Right? Um, but they're here to stay. You know, I run a, I run a school and uh, we're very much, we're very dynamic, we're growing and then the evaluation measures that are asked from me by the state administration, even though we're a private school, they, they very often don't make any sense for us. Right? So what do you do? You just fill them out, so you end up gaming the system. <laughs> right? And you continue doing your work. <laughs> but I, I can certainly see that they, they're useful in more uh, steady state, steady state in environments. Right? Uh, one more ob observation to that. When to the extent to which you have nonprofits becoming participants in, in quasi markets, right? Then uh, what happens increasingly are monetary representations of performance, and not so less uh, more qualitative measures. Right? And that is definitely where we're moving, right? And um, the, are they dis do you discuss quasi markets a lot and market making a lot at the school? So w watch out for that. I think the, the, the more quasi-markets you get in a particular field, the less emphasis ought to be put on many other performance measures because you have pricing. And price is usually a very, very good. And anything uh, relating to price is a, a much better system than uh, all the reporting that nonprofits have to do. Well, thank you so much. I've been enjoyed that. <laughs>